morning everyone so today it's beginning of a second week of stephanie one is back to south africa i would be here for three weeks already one is over and uh, for this uh, monday 16th of january i have an appointment at 9 a.m with the glen carlo um 11 at fairview wine and cheese and then at 2 at warwick wine estates and at 4 30 at kenoko so i am in stellenbosch and i will be in stellenbosch for a few days in fact so voilà, let's go We've got about 50 odd hectares under mine. And so for us, very much our strength lies in very classic styles. So it's Burgundy, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Bordeaux varieties. We're relatively young when it comes to being in the South African wine industry. The South African wine industry's got a huge wealth of history. Yes. And um, Glen Carlo, we're just actually celebrating our 30th harvest this year. So in 2017, that's 30 years of of producing Chardonnay so yeah, specifically. 20, so it had been 30 years? 30. Et donc me voici sortie de chez Glen Carlo et je viens d'arriver donc dans un autre domaine viticole qui s'appelle Fairview. Je sais qu'ils font aussi des fromages, donc ça s'appelle Fairview Wine and Cheese. Et puis voilà, donc on y va. Je fais très bien la chèvre. Ou la brebis plutôt. The history of Fairview started back in 1936 actually when the farm was owned by the Bucks the first time. The farm has been existing since 1639 and that was the first time that they were a vines plant. And Charles Back, who's the current owner, he's the third generation. And he replanted quite a lot of the vineyards on the farm, um, especially to the to the varieties that is suited for our terroir, um, which is the Patissera Durif, um, your Rhone varietals. All um, Amphibio's vineyards come from four different areas. We have vineyards in Paul itself, we have vineyards in Stellenbosch, we have vineyards in Darling, and then we also have um, vineyards in the Swatland. So we just arrived at Warwick Winery. Hmm? Warwick Estate.
I can test the one in Singapore, but I can't meet you in Singapore and I can't come and see that in Singapore. So if I travel, it's because I need to understand who you are. Well, that's fine. So... Cheers. Cheers? <laughs> so what is the name coming from? Is it you or your dad who opened the winery or...? Uh, my granddad. I mean, it's a 100% family business. Always has been. My mother was the first woman to make wine in South Africa. And actually, for eight years, she was the only, only woman. So a lot of our, a lot of our wines have got some female stories around them. Of, uh, like this wine is called the First Lady, named after my mother. Uh, but this this wine is from uh, was named in the 1920s. It's uh, named after a professor that created a type of peach. And for many years, for more than 50 years at Warwick, we had peaches. Do you want to say hello? Hey, it's Nick. Hi. Hi. I'm Nick. I'm the winemaker here. Stephanie, nice to meet you. Hi, Stephanie. Nice to meet you. We do, um, we do make a pinotage, but I'm actually, I'm actually stopping it. You don't like it? Uh, you know, I think you must be, you must pick something and give it focus. Mm. I, I sometimes think we make too many wines. So making fewer wines make them better. So. So we do two cabernets. So this is a uh, this is a single vineyard, and this is a, a multi vineyard blend. This is called the First Lady. It's by far the the number one selling uh, high end cabernet in the country. There's nothing. Even our closest competitor is only half. So this is um, doing very well. Also 100% cabernet sauvignon. If you see the January issue of Decanter magazine, like the the issue that's out now, there's an article on Cabernet from Stellenbosch. Oh yeah. And um, this is the, rated the, the the number one Cabernet in Stellenbosch in Decanto in January. On the blind testing, if you would have to recognize someone's bearing, let's say it's a blind testing and you need to, do, to define from where that one is coming from. I mean the mo most prominent variety in the Simonsberg is Cabernet. I think the best Cabernet from South Africa all comes from the Simonsburg. Um, I think you would be looking towards uh, some very pleasant, uh, sometimes leafy, sometimes a little bit of herbaceousness, sometimes minty, mintiness in the Cabernet that is not unripeness, but it's very much terroir driven. I think sometimes it's got a similar flavor profile to the Kunawara. So I just left Warwick and I just arrived at Kanankoop for the last tasting of this uh, Monday, beginning of the second week in South Africa. Kanankoop has been in the same family for now 113 years. So fourth generation owners, they're South Africans, they are two brothers, they live here, they work here, this is what they do full time. The family has never been in production. They're always the business people. So we always have a winemaker and a viticulturist that are employed. But in 48 years, we've only had three winemakers, mm. which is quite something. So our current winemaker is Aubrey Bierslar, and he has been here since 2002. And he's in his early 40s. So, and he's been awarded International Winemaker of the Year twice already wow. in his lifetime, in 2008 and in 2015. Um, but all three of those winemakers are friends and they're friends of the family as well. Um, and they will always have that invested feeling in Kanonkop. They will tell you, it's not them, it's the terroir and it's what the farm gives you. So it's very simple. We do things quite differently than many other wineries. We only have four varieties on about 100 hectares. Half of it is Pinotage. Good, more than 30% is Cabernet Sauvignon. So those are two main grape varieties. We have a little bit of Merlot and a little bit of Cabernet Franc. And the reason for that is we wanted to focus from the beginning. So for 40 years, we made four wines and that was it. Through a blind tasting, how would you recognize mm. the Pinotage? Right, I love your question. <laughs> okay, so obviously when I started learning about wine, Pinotage was part of my world. And it was the first grape variety I could recognize. 
how I recognize it. Firstly, okay, it's more purple than many other grape varieties. So the, this, it's the same tone of purple that you will find in Zinfandel or Petit Vada. It is, I get on the nose, I get a blackness. My first impression always is black. And that's the same, it's for me it's like those really dark plums. You know, those plums that almost look black from purpleness. I always get a bit of a iodine inky kind of character. Something oh. like, you know that squid ink, this like squid ink pasta? Yep. Those are my two markers for pinotage. Mm. Then, um, that's just on the nose. You get that, that first recognition. And those Jenny very dark ripe plums but obviously you get many different styles of pinotage very light yes. almost pinot noirish to very dark to very modern to all of it so you know it can it can confuse you and then on the palate always higher acidity than many other grape varieties almost something you know it, it sometimes reminds me of uh, some of the Italian grape varieties with a with the acidity and the fresh fruit something like um, Dolcetto or something like that. Obviously, it's bigger, and more robust. But you understand what I'm saying? That that kind of a freshness to it, mm. higher acidity, lower tannins, and then that sweetness at the end. Although it's bone dry, mm -hmm. there's like a little sweet fruit lift at the end, mm. and that's very typical of Pinotage. If it gets older, you know what it what I've confused it with no. is old Rioja. I'm not talking about the very warm, spicy, friendly, you know, very American oaky. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the more tarry, um, black, inky, that, you know, you know what I'm talking about? That mm -hmm. when Rioja gets old, gets that very tarry kind of character. That's what you sometimes can confuse it with. Oh, okay. mm. 